Um, what I want to focus on is uh, one of the roots of self directed support, which is the individual service fund approach. And um, in Highland, we've been able to use that approach with a number of people, and I thought I would share with you some of how that's going and how that's working. Just a bit about Highland Home Care is we have been operating as a, as a we've been operating as a domiciliary care and housing support provider since 1994, and in 2004 we became an employee-owned company, uh, which means that we are able to use uh, the skills of our staff and, and work with them in a way that they begin to understand uh, much more closely about the buying into what the company is about. Um, so, we, we're a generic provider of services, we don't specialise with any particular client groups. Um, when we did the buyout in 2004, we had about around about 100 staff and we're now around about 350. So we've grown fairly significantly in that time. Um, we are particularly, I particularly wanted to mention the, the whole NHS integration because I think that has been something that in Highland has been unique and has actually, from my perspective, been a significant driver for change and improvement of, of quality of services that we can provide. And good luck to the rest of you in Scotland for coming down that route because I'm a firm believer in it. Um, and, and as uh, uh, Donald maybe mentioned, we have, as a company, we've tried to get involved in self directed support in all its ways, uh, any way we can, and I've been involved in the People's Partners Project, and we've also tried to work in the, um, with Donald in the Highlands with other providers to try and use the SDS and learn about SDS much better. So I'll talk a little bit about what's been happening in Highland over the last couple of years or so. Um, the Highland was one of the three original pilot areas for self-directed support, uh, way back when I forget how long ago it was. Uh, but actually Highland Council, as it was then, took a deliberate policy to just concentrate on young people in transition. And it was, it was primarily a direct payment approach. So when the new self-directed support team was established on the Jennifer who's here today, um, they wanted to look at developing a, an individual service fund pilot project in the Highlands and a number of providers were approached to see if we would be interested in becoming involved. Uh, and Highland Home Carers at that time said yes we'd like to get involved. This was back in mid-2011. Um, Prior to that time, I have to say that there were a number of service users who we had been working with um, in a way, to, almost in anticipation of this happening. So there were people who had either some of their own finances or they had uh, money from ILF or direct payments. And we, we got into a process of negotiating with these individuals um, about recruitment of their own staff, choice of their own, of who they work, who works with them, negotiating around fee rates so that we almost broke away from the, the local authority determined how much we were charging. We, we decided that we would uh, not have fixed rates and it, it, it lends an issue to this marketing issue that I, I found quite difficult because I'm very reluctant to support something that says, right, this is what we charge, because I, I tend to believe that actually we, what we as providers are going to have to do is to almost negotiate in each individual case about what we're going to charge and how much we're going to take. Um, so we had been doing some of that work previously. As part of the pilot with, uh, with the self direct support team, we identified about a dozen individuals at that stage, and we started working with them on the development of support plans and an outcome-based approach between sort of mid-2011. Um, unfortunately, it took quite a lengthy time for the, um, let's say, the, the bureaucracy to, to kick in and to work and to agree how that was going to happen. And it was, it was 
late spring in 2012, before we were actually able to begin working with these individuals in a self directed support way, you know, using an ISF approach. The, by that time, we'd lost six of them. So we were down to six people um, on, the, on the pilot at that point. And they were lost for a number of reasons. And one of the, the key factors, um, which I haven't put on that slide, I think was that the individual care managers for those people, or community nurses as they were in some cases, didn't buy into this process. Um, and because we didn't have their support, it made it quite difficult to, to actually work with people who were already in receipt of the service and try to change the way in which we were working with them. Um, one, of the, one of the big positives, I think, that happened in Highland, and again, that's uh, you know, working together in partnership with NHS Highland and, and their team, was the development of a three-way three agreement uh, almost a, a mini contract in a way between the provider, the individual who's receiving the service and the NHS Highland. And I think, I mean, my, my feeling about that having been at meetings nationally was that Highland was pretty go ahead and unique in that sense in terms of evolving that because it's a four page document and I saw pre examples at the time that were sort of 70 to 90 pages of contract and, and how anybody works with that if you're working with uh, people who are in receipt of care services, I've no idea. But I think we, I think we managed to put together a, a contract that was very, very useful and worked for people. And I think that's been one of the big factors. Uh, another aspect was the training of staff. I know Jim referred to that, but we went out and purchased training from Helen Sanderson Associates. We used money um, through the Change Fund in Highlands to try and roll out uh, training to enable people to think differently uh, and if you get a chance to use any of their training materials or uh, get them to come and deliver training, it's, it was, it's been excellent and I know the subject of support team in Highland has gone on to use them to do additional support planning training and, and stuff like that. The other thing about the integration approach uh, in Highland is that it is a much closer working relationship so that providers and purchases are all meeting regularly and working together much more and I think that has helped us to do things in a different sort of way. So we had six people who started in sort of spring 2012 with an ISF approach. Um, I have to say that on balance um, I don't think it was a great success. I don't think it was very successful. There were marginal, marginal gains and improvements in terms of control and in terms of what they were able to achieve by having an ISF rather than a traditional service. But overall, the difficulties in transforming or changing what had been a service that people were used to having over a lengthy period of time into something that might be very different, I think is, uh, is extremely difficult. And I, I, would, I would say we didn't succeed in the vast bulk of cases. Um, and that to me says, as a learning for all of us in the longer run, that trying to change what we're already delivering to people who are in, in receipt of the service will not be easy. And that actually what we probably should be doing is thinking about new people coming in to receive social care and how we might provide different services for them. So what I want to concentrate on is um, actually taking through six case studies of people who have been using an ISF approach over a very length of time. Um, I think I've covered all that. Apart from um, the preparation time, and I think that that's something that um, I don't think we had anticipated before we started, but the time that is required to actually set up an individual package under an ISF is significantly longer than, uh, than what we've been used to under a traditional service where basically the referral comes in and you set it up and it goes. I and mean, you're used to doing that. With an individual service fund, there's quite a lot of negotiation, quite a lot of working with different people, sometimes a huge number of people, to actually get something before you can start. And uh, so I, I cannot stress highly enough that that is an implication for all providers to be aware that it will take longer. Um, however, 
What I think I can demonstrate is that in the longer term, what we're aiming for is virtually minimum intervention for the for the the ISF packages to run themselves and for not for not us not having to spend a lot of time thereafter keeping it going. And that has been my experience. Okay, so this, these are the six the six cases. How long have I got gone? The first one is young, we were approached again through the self direct support team, and this is the partnership approach. Um, a young man living in Westeros, those of you who know Westeros know it's pretty isolated out there, not a lot of services, in fact virtually no services. Um, he had been in the mainstream school, um, although he has a learning disability and cerebral palsy. Um, come out of school and his, his family quite rightly is saying, well what is there now for him? An active young man, uh, doesn't take kindly to sitting at the desk, and the only resource available to him was uh, half, a, half a day a week run by the MS College in Western Ross for people with a learning disability, and that was very much such sit at the desk and be taught. Um, and they brought with the family basically approached the local authority and said, This isn't good enough, you need to, you need to be providing services for our son. And I, I was a party to some of those discussions that went beforehand, but broadly we were asked if we could try and do anything using an ISF approach to try and help them. Um, so I got involved at that stage and we were able to negotiate and agree about how many hours a week he was going to get and what the funding for that would be. Um, we were able to help the family recruit somebody locally who they already knew, and in fact they identified him. Um, to be a support worker for this young man and we gave him a contract to work for those 30 hours a week and virtually then left the family and the support worker to, dis to design a package of support for him. Um, I mean, the really the only, the only process for us since then has been to be a payroll, you know, to do the payroll side of things, to work to go and be involved in reviews and any get involved in discussions if there's any particular issues. Can we do this? Can we do that? Is more the sort of uh, this is this actually is a picture of him. He's been on the dry stage hiking course um, with his support worker, and um, he's he's been skiing. He's done a whole range of different activities. He's been learning and growing and developing and meeting all the outcomes that were set at the very beginning. And and yet from from our point of view, Santa Paris, we're almost oblivious to it. It's just going on. We get the we get the uh, the money cut. The invoice goes out. The money comes in once every four weeks. The payroll operates every fortnight, and that's virtually the contact we have with it. So, from a cost point of view, for us as a provider, the cost is in setting it up, and thereafter, it's a, it's been a, a huge success. Um, the second one is uh, slightly more complicated. This is an elderly woman in Strathspey, and again, we were approached by the social work service. Um, this woman had been in hospital. She's in her 90s. She'd been in hospital um, and wanted to get discharged home. Family wanted her to be discharged home. The social work service was saying there's no care provided at home you'll have to go into a nursing home basically. And the family were not happy with that. The, the woman herself didn't want that, she wanted to go home. Uh, there'd been a fairly lengthy process. They actually took her home and the family supported her and they pulled in friends and neighbours and a whole range of different people who, who had basically helped her to stay at home remarkably successfully. And, um, we were asked to come in and help to sort of formalise that process and we um, set up contracts. Some of the people came and worked for us. There was a particular problem around um, paying money to self-employed people which caused a few problems at that stage and I don't think others have come across that. Um, it was, there was limited funding approved, a lot of it was still having to be paid for by the family themselves um, but we helped to put uh, a care plan, a support plan in place. Um, and it was just, it had just begun to start and was going pretty well, and unfortunately the woman herself died. But she'd been able to come out of hospital and I think that was, I see that as actually positive. Uh, 
The, the third one, a uh, young woman in Inverness with a physical disability, um, huge package of care and support. Um, I don't believe our service really adapted very well to the demands that she made on. She was making lots of demands about what she wanted at fairly short notice. She wanted this, she wanted to go down to Glasgow for a weekend, she wanted to you know, go somewhere, do this, have somebody available almost on tap who she could just decide, right, I want to do this here and then. And I think as a traditional service, we really never cracked that one. Uh, we never were able to, to give that level of flexibility. And she achieved a lot, and she did a lot in the year that she was received the service. She's now actually moved elsewhere. But um, in that time, we, we struggled to, to change what we were doing. And to, so I think the learning from that is, again, that we need to set the ground rules fairly closely early on. And I think we needed to have thought more earlier about possibly recruiting individuals to work directly with the person rather than us providing the service as well. The fourth one is a very straightforward one. The family approached us, they have two disabled children, their respite service had fallen apart for a variety of reasons. They asked us if we would, if we would help them to recruit people and uh, basically then leave them to, to provide respite in their own home for their children. And we, um, so we went through a process that we were at, at really like an employment agency, little more, um, agreed rates of pay with them that they should pay the support workers who they were utilising. We recruited the people, we did the PBGs and all the safe recruitment process, and then we just become a payroll service basically. The fourth, the fifth one is probably the most interesting, and I've got about two minutes, so I'll just finish, <laughs> finish off with that one. It's uh, a man with spinal injuries, again down in Strats Bay, he doesn't even know Strats Bay, it's extremely difficult to provide services in the community down there, very few care. The only providers down there basically the in house service, and they struggle to provide care for people. Uh, this was a man with spinal injuries who, I mean, an elderly man, or, well, elderly, he's not older than me, but uh, he would be classed as over 65 now. Um, and uh, he had a spinal injury, he, lit, he had come, he was in, the, in Glasgow in your specialist unit down here. They said he, they'd done all they could, he was ready to go home, no services available, also being told, basically it's nursing home or hospital for the rest of your life. Um, and we were again approached through the self doubt support team to see if we could assist in an ISF approach. And we managed to recruit, um, with the help of the family, around about a dozen people initially who we went through a process of recruitment. We're down to probably five or six now. I think one learning is that we hadn't done enough work with the family themselves about what they could expect of individual carers or support workers. And, and some people who we recruited and started, and we thought they were good, they basically very quickly said, oh, we don't want them, we don't want them. Um, we're down to five or six people, but it's actually, you know, he's now been at home, I think, for nearly six months. Um, he's being supported there. The, the level of contact that I have, or we have with, with them, has reduced. They are, the, the, the individual members of staff know they can contact us they need advice and so forth and we have somebody who's now pregnant um, and we're having to work out how do we deal with that as an issue, haven't quite sorted what, how that works, um, issues around sickness of staff, basically the other, they've created a team and they cover for each other but it's around the contract issue and I don't think we've ever cracked fully the contract, how we contract people who are not directly employed by us but are employed by us in a way and I think that's something we're still learning about. So just to finish up, these are radishes by the way of a guy in Easter Ross, in Western Ross <laughs> um, the, so the concentration, the preparation time and the investment in time at that stage helps to get things right. The financial side I think is quite crucial that you work that out fairly carefully beforehand. Um, as to how that's going to operate so that it's, everybody's clear what's happening. The employee contracts are saying, I think we've still not cracked that, although I've, I think I've just about got a contract worked out that will, will satisfy employment law, but also doesn't mean we're fully uh, taking on responsibilities. Uh, the admin systems, our admin team have got very uh, anxious about the whole process of self-directed support. 
I think in practice it's not proven as complex or as difficult as, as they had anticipated and because it's really just linking a lot of time people into our payroll system as they are. Um, and I think the issue of employee support and supervision is something that I think with the, the situation with the, the man with spinal injuries in, in uh, Stats Pay is one that I still not fully cracked as to whether we ought to have somebody locally down there who can provide that level of support. So that's, that's me.